Welcome to today's lecture. I am Professor Ku. In today's lecture, let's explore the fascinating world of metabolomics and its pivotal role in advancing plant sciences. Metabolomics is the comprehensive study of metabolites within a system, offering deep insights into the biochemical activities occurring within plants. Our primary objective is to understand how metabolomics can be utilized in plant sciences and to be able to utilize metabolomics and multivariate analysis in research. Metabolomics is the scientific study focused on the comprehensive analysis of metabolites in a biological organism. The advantage of metabolomics lies in its direct link to the phenotype. By analyzing the complete set of metabolites or the metabolome, it offers a snapshot of the organism's current biochemical state. This is crucial because the phenotype, including traits like pest resistance, taste, and flavor, is the direct manifestation of underlying biochemical processes. Through metabolomics, scientists can observe the immediate effect of genetic manipulations, environmental changes, or treatments on the organism's biochemical pathways. Furthermore, metabolomics facilitates the discovery of novel biomolecules with potential applications in various industries, such as pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, and biotechnology. The metabolomics integrates with genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics in systems biology to provide a holistic view of an organism's function. It adds a dynamic layer reflecting real-time biochemical activity, and when combined with other omics, it helps build a comprehensive model of cellular processes. This slide presents the various levels of metabolomic approaches. These methods range from highly focused to comprehensive, each with its unique balance of accuracy and scope. At the precise end, we have target analysis, which is like using a high powered lens to look at a few selected metabolites with great detail. It offers us a sharp, clear view, but of a very small area. Then we expand our view to metabolite profiling. Here, we're still in the realm of specifics, like lipids, for instance, but we're looking at a broader group. Think of it as zooming out a little. We lose some sharpness, but we start to see how these pieces fit into larger patterns. Finally, there's the wide angle lens of metabolomics. We open up our view to observe all metabolites in a sample. This panoramic perspective trades a bit of detail for the ability to see the whole landscape. It's less about a single tree and more about the entire forest. This diagram presents the workflow of plant metabolomics, a field that involves the comprehensive study of small molecules within plants. The process is sequential and each step is critical to ensure the quality and interpretability of the data. Sample preparation. This is the first step where the plant sample is prepared for analysis. This often involves homogenization and extraction to isolate the metabolites. The sample is then injected into the analysis instrument. Data generation. The prepared samples are analyzed using instruments like gas chromatography mass spectrometry, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. These techniques help in detecting and quantifying the metabolites present in the sample. Input file conversion. The raw data generated by these instruments need to be converted into a format suitable for analysis, such as NET, CDF, AMZ, EX, ML, and etc. This is a data wrangling step that ensures compatibility with downstream processing tools. Data cleaning. This involves the removal of noise and artifacts from the data. Base correction, signal distortion correction, and intensity filtering are standard procedures in this step to ensure that the data are as accurate as possible. Feature extraction. Here, the aim is to identify and quantify the features, metabolites, in the data sets. This may involve deconvolution of overlapping signals, handling of multiplets, and other techniques to isolate individual metabolite signatures from the complex data. Compound identification. Once features are extracted, 
they need to be identified as specific metabolites. This is often achieved by searching against databases like the NIST, PyMOL database, etc., using the spectral data obtained from the instruments. Sample alignment. In cases where multiple samples are analyzed, their data need to be aligned. This involves ensuring that a given feature is compared across different samples correctly, which often requires chromatogram alignment. Statistical analysis. This step involves the use of statistical tools to analyze the data. The aim is to identify patterns, trends, and statistically significant differences between groups of samples. Interpretation. The last step involves interpreting the results of the statistical analysis in the context of the biological system being studied. The findings here can lead to a deeper understanding of the metabolic pathways and their alterations under different conditions. Metabolomics, a field at the intersection of biology, chemistry, and data science, employs a variety of methodologies to study the complex chemical processes within living organisms. Two prominent approaches in metabolomics are quantitative methods and chemometric methods, each offering distinct advantages in unraveling the intricacies of the plant metabolome. Quantitative methods excel in metabolite level accuracy, direct profiling, and detecting subtle changes under varied conditions. Meanwhile, chemometric methods offer unbiased data exploration, biomarker identification, and predictive insights based on metabolic profiles. Together, they form vital tools in understanding complex metabolic systems. Targeted metabolomics is a focused approach where we're interested in quantifying a specific set of known metabolites. It's like having a shopping list at a grocery store. You know exactly what you need and you go straight to those items. In the lab, this translates to meticulous sample preparation, which may involve steps like solvent extraction, centrifugation, and derivatization to prepare the selected metabolites for analysis. Instrumentation like GC, LCMS, or GCMS then precisely measures these metabolites. On the other hand, untargeted metabolomics is more like taking a panoramic photograph of everything available in the store without a list. We're not looking for anything specific. Instead, we're capturing all metabolites present in a sample to get a comprehensive overview. Here, the initial sample preparation doesn't need to be tailored to specific metabolites. This approach is particularly useful for discovering new biomarkers or getting an unbiased look at the metabolome. When preparing for targeted metabolomics, as illustrated in the slide, all metabolite identifications have been completed and are listed out. Black line. Each column holds a different sample. Red line. The first row contains the unique identifier for each sample, and the second row provides the tissue or group name, which serves as the label information. Utilizing this targeted metabolomics data set, we can analyze alterations in plant physiology resulting from specific treatments or lipid class enrichments complemented by keg pathway information. This slide displays a data sheet for untargeted metabolomics, which is a comprehensive analytical approach used to profile all the metabolites in a biological sample without prior knowledge of the compounds present. Not all metabolite identifications have been completed. They are listed by molecular weight and retention time in seconds, black line. Each column represents a different sample, red line. The goal is to capture the most significantly changed compounds for biomarker identification in regression or classification models. Thus, using statistical analysis, significantly changed peaks are selected and later identified using mass spectrometry. In this slide, a peak with a molecular weight of 363.1 and a retention time of 694 seconds was identified as pentaric acid. In untargeted metabolomics, there is no need to identify all possible measurable peaks for dataset preparation. Only significant peaks are required for identification. 
From now, we'll explore how multivariate analysis techniques are utilized in metabolomics, their importance in deciphering complex biological systems, and the types of multivariate analysis commonly employed in this field. Metabolomics data is inherently complex due to the vast number of metabolites present in biological samples and the dynamic nature of metabolic processes. Traditional univariate methods, which analyze one variable at a time, are often insufficient for fully characterizing this complexity. Multivariate analysis refers to a set of statistical techniques used to analyze data sets that contain multiple variables. Unlike univariate analysis, which examines one variable at a time, multivariate analysis considers the relationships between multiple variables simultaneously. The iris flower dataset is indeed a well-known example of a dataset that includes multiple variables. It contains measurements of sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width for three different species of iris flowers. This dataset is commonly used to demonstrate various statistical and machine learning techniques, including multivariate analysis. Compared to using only one variable, such as petal length, when we incorporate both petal and sepal length into our analysis, we observe a more pronounced differentiation between the species of iris flowers. By considering multiple variables simultaneously, we gain a more comprehensive understanding of the underlying characteristics that differentiate the species. This enhanced clarity in separation is crucial for accurate classification as it reduces the overlap between species and minimizes misclassification errors. Multivariate analysis stands as a transformative approach in metabolomics, enabling comprehensive exploration of complex data sets to discover underlying patterns, trends, and metabolite relationships. It plays a crucial role in biomarker discovery by pinpointing metabolite alterations linked with specific biological states or diseases, thus facilitating early detection and intervention. Additionally, it serves as a predictive tool allowing for the classification of samples into distinct groups or forecasting biological outcomes based on metabolite profiles. Now let's explore into the various multivariate analysis methods frequently utilized in the field of metabolomics. PCA is a dimensionality reduction technique that identifies patterns of variation in metabolomics, data by transforming variables into a new set of orthogonal components. It helps visualize sample clustering and identifies outliers. Partial least squares, discriminant analysis, PLSDA, is a supervised classification method that maximizes the separation between predefined sample groups based on their metabolite profiles. It is often used for biomarker discovery and sample classification. Orthogonal projections to latent structures OPLS extends PLS by separating predictive and orthogonal variation in the data, thereby enhancing the interpretability of the models. Here are the essential characteristics of PCA streamlined into key points. Dimensionality reduction. PCA compresses data by recalibrating the original variables into principal components reducing the number of variables while preserving the essence of the data. Pattern discovery. It uncovers hidden patterns by leveraging the correlations among features, revealing the structure within data sets. Orthogonality. Each principal component stands independent of the others, ensuring that the derived components do not share information and are statistically uncorrelated. Scores and loadings. PCA generates scores that provide a new, simpler representation of the data and loadings that quantify each original variable's influence on each principal component, data visualization. By reducing dimensions, PCA facilitates the visualization of complex data, making it possible to plot and interpret high dimensional data sets in two or three dimensions. Unsupervised approach, as a non-supervised algorithm, PCA organizes data without needing predefined categories or labels, discovering natural groupings within the data. PCA comprises two main components, the score plot and the loading plot. 
The score plot visualizes the data points projected onto the principal components, often simplifying the data set to two or three dimensions for easy visual interpretation. Let's explore PCA scatter plots to understand the distribution of data. The primary axis, PC1, captures the most variation, while PC2 shows the next most. Their length reflects the variance they explain. Data points represent individual observations with shapes or colors indicating group membership. Ellipses around clusters suggest a 95% confidence area for group variation, indicating consistency within and separation between groups. Note that the ellipses encapsulating data clusters are not arbitrary. They are typically generated by software. Shorter explanations focus on the dispersion of data points for within-group diversity and the gap between clusters along PC1 for between-group differences. Loading plots show each variable's contribution to variation with proximity to axes and clustering indicating significance and relationships, respectively guiding our understanding and analysis. Let's bring back IRIS dataset. Here's score and loading plots of IRIS dataset. Different species separated in score plot, although not 100% clear separation. Loading plot shows petal width and petal length related with PC1 separation between Setosa and Versicolor, as well as Virginica. A loading plot can be numerically depicted as a correlation matrix with rows for variables and columns for principal components. The matrix entries show how strongly each variable correlates with each component. High values mean strong influence. Low values mean less. This matrix quantifies the variable component relationships, paralleling the insights from loading plot visuals. This slide showcases my previous publication, which examined the phytochemical content across various broccoli tissues for byproduct utilization. Utilizing the data set from this study, I will provide another explanation of principal component analysis. In the PCA analysis, PC1 captures 51.1% of the variance, underscoring key differences in the data set, while PC2, orthogonal to PC1, accounts for an additional 39.8% of the variance. Collectively, they encapsulate 90.9% .9 of the dataset's variability, offering an extensive overview of its structure. The loadings plot reveals which variables, such as distinct metabolites, are principal in influencing the separation observed in the PCA. Pronounced loadings on PC1 or PC2 indicate these variables are crucial in differentiating between tissue types. These score and loading plots are interrelated and together provide a complementary explanation. For instance, the fluorite tissue positioned in the upper left of the score plot corresponds to a region in the loading plot populated by various amino acids, suggesting a higher concentration of these compounds in the fluorite tissue. Clicking on specific data points in the loading plot would yield detailed information about the metabolites in Metabo Analyst. In this slide, at the bottom of the score plot, there is stem tissue. In the same location where glucose is identified on the loading plot. The box and whisker plot shows that glucose levels are relatively higher in the stem tissue compared to other tissues. Here's some tips for data pre-processing for metabolomics. Normalization of metabolomics. Data is essential for ensuring data quality, comparability, and interpretability in multivariate analysis. By reducing technical variability and enhancing statistical power, normalization enables more robust and reliable insights into the complex biological processes underlying metabolic phenotypes. The primary scaling techniques commonly employed include auto-scaling, range scaling, and Pareto scaling. Each method presents unique advantages and challenges. Thus, it is essential to acknowledge that a universal solution does not exist. It is advisable to explore various methods and rigorously assess your model's performance to identify the most suitable scaling approach for your particular data set. Let us initiate with auto scaling, or as it is alternatively known, standard scaling or z score normalization. 
This method standardizes each feature to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Its principal advantage lies in normalizing all features to a uniform scale, which is especially beneficial for algorithms that are sensitive to the scale of input data, such as correlation analysis, support vector machines, or K means clustering. However, its susceptibility to outliers, which can skew the mean and standard deviation, stands as a notable limitation. Moving on to range scaling, also referred to as min-max scaling, this technique adjusts features to conform to a specific range, commonly from zero to one. This method retains the original distribution of data and is intuitive, linking well with biological data scaling. Nonetheless, it exhibits a high sensitivity to outliers and introducing new data points that extend beyond the original bounds can lead to complications. Lastly, Pareto scaling is an adaptation of the auto scaling method integrating the square root of the number of features in its computation of standard deviation. This is particularly effective for diminishing the predominance of features with extensive variances, thereby ensuring a proportionate influence on the total variance. Pareto scaling remains more aligned with original measurements than auto scaling, but is still sensitive to substantial fold changes. Scaling is a critical pre-processing step in multivariate analysis that can substantially affect the outcomes of the analysis. The application of different scaling methods can lead to vastly different results. This is particularly apparent in the loading plots derived from PCA, where the prominence of certain metabolites can vary depending on the scaling technique used. When we look at PCA score plots, we notice that PC1 and PC2 representing the first two principal components, can explain different percentages of variance in the data. Furthermore, the corresponding loading plot may highlight different metabolites as being significant, which underscores the need for careful consideration when choosing a scaling method to ensure that the biological interpretation of the data is accurate. PLSDA is a variant of PLS regression which is a supervised learning method used for classification problems. In PLSDA, the response matrix Y is categorical. This technique melds principles from principal component analysis and regression to identify the directions or components that most effectively differentiate between classes. PLSDA seeks to maximize the covariance between the predictor variables in matrix X and the categorical responses in matrix Y, focusing on those variations within the predictors that are most predictive of class distinctions. Variable importance for projection, VIP, scores emerge as a key feature of PLSDA, highlighting the variables that most significantly contribute to the model in terms of predictive power and explained variance, thus assisting in the identification of potential biomarkers. OPLSDA begins by dividing the systematic variation within the predictor data set, labeled X, into two distinct parts. The first part captures variation that is linearly correlated with our response variable Y, essentially the signal that relates directly to our outcome of interest. The second part is the orthogonal variation, which is not correlated with Y. This captures the noise, random variation and systematic variation that do not contribute to the relationship we're interested in, such as batch effects or other confounding factors. The brilliance of OPLSDA lies in these two types of variations. Predictive variation. This is the variation that's correlated between X and Y, and it's where we find our meaningful data the relationships that can predict or explain Y based on X. Orthogonal variation. This is the uncorrelated variation, which helps us clean up our data by separating out the noise from the signal. By focusing only on the predictive variation, OPLSDA can enhance the interpretability of our models and improve the quality of our factors. This is particularly useful when we're trying to discern subtle differences between classes that might be muddled by noise in our data. 
PLSDA and OPLSDA are both multivariate statistical methods used for classification and discrimination. However, there are key differences. Variation, separation, PLSDA does not distinguish between variation in the predictor variables, X. That is predictive of the response, variable, Y, and the variation that isn't. OPLSDA extends PLSDA by separating predictive and non-predictive orthogonal variation in X. This means that OPLSDA isolates the variation in X that's directly related to Y from the variation that's unrelated. Number of components. PLSDA may require more components to achieve a similar level of discrimination compared to OPLSDA which achieves discrimination with fewer components thanks to the separation of unrelated variation. Overfitting potential. By isolating orthogonal variation, OPLSDA can potentially reduce the risk of overfitting, which can occur in PLSDA if the model becomes too complex by trying to account for too much of the variation in X, including noise. PCA might incidentally separate classes if the principal components align with class differences, but this isn't its primary goal. PLSDA directly seeks to separate classes, making it more effective than PCA for this purpose. OPLSDA can offer the most refined separation by isolating only the relevant variants for class discrimination, potentially providing the clearest separation among the three methods. Today's lecture provided an overview of metabolomics, a field that performs an exhaustive analysis of metabolites to understand biological organisms. We've seen how its strength lies in the direct correlation with phenotypes, providing a clear window into the organism's functional state. We've also explored how multivariate analysis techniques, specifically PCA, PLSDA, and OPLSDA, enable us to navigate through complex data and identify patterns, trends, and potential biomarkers. In our next session, we will explore deeper into how metabolomics data can be used in classification and regression models to further our research.